Hey, good morning, church, and welcome to Grace Place. We want to start off today by saying happy Father's Day to all those of you who are dads or grandfathers, or if you're someone who has stepped in to the role of dad in someone's life. We hope today you feel extra blessing and honor on you. If this is your very first time here at Grace Place, you are a VIP. And if you're here in house, I would invite you to stop at our VIP tent when you leave today. We have a team there that is able to answer your questions and we have a gift for you. And if you're joining us for the first time online, we would love to be able to connect with you as well. And so you can grab your phone and text the word welcome to 970-800-2421. Here at Grace Place, we believe that ministry doesn't just happen on Sundays, but throughout the week. And so we are always looking for ways to connect with people and minister to people every single day. And this is what you give towards when you give through the ministry at Grace Place. If you would like to give to Grace Place, there are several ways you can do that. You can jump online at graceplace.org and click on the Give tab. You can also give at any of our giving boxes around the campus, or you can text any amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your continued generosity and faithfulness. Today, we are excited to have joining us Ron Waterman. He is going to be interviewed today by Pastor Clay Peck. So check out this video and then give him a warm Grace Place welcome. H2O Waterman. Let's give it up for our guest today. Thank you. Thank you. Ron is uh, dad, so happy Father's Day to you and all of you who are Thank dads you today. Much. You've got your eight year old daughter here on the front row and with your father. Happy Father's Day. That's right. And uh, you guys have been coming to Grace Place for few years since before COVID, I think. Yeah. You yeah. moved to Berthoud, live out west, and started getting into horses, riding horses. Your daughter's uh, got some ribbons already, and uh, so you wanted to learn with her. Imagine what kind of a horse this guy needs. <laughs> He's got a draft horse. Seriously, it's a big draft horse. <laughs> it works. It works. works. So uh, you, are, uh, you work out a lot. You know, you're like you like me. We kind of look the same. A few years, a few years. I feel like a little guy next to you. Uh, some of these teenagers right here on the front row, you're going to learn something you didn't know. You ever seen one of these? You don't know what it is? One out of four. <laughs> I know those guys don't know. So archaeologists have found these they're, they're from uh, they had white pages for names and phone numbers and yellow pages for businesses this was before google that's why we don't use these anymore but this thing is about a thousand pages who thinks that i can rip this thing in half anybody i, I only got one person in each service how many think he can rip it in half <laughs> I'm not talking about opening it like this and ripping it. I'm talking about rip it right down there. You think you can do it? 
You want to check it out first? Come down here. Check it out. Make sure it's legit. Thumb through Make there. sure it didn't already get started a little bit, you know, like there's any. It's real. It's legit. <laughs> it's a real book. <laughs> All right. Show us what you can do there. All right. Ron. It's kind of fun because I do go into uh, a lot of schools today, uh, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and I ask, uh, the first thing I do is I hold this up and I ask them if they know what it is, and it's, it's like crickets in the crowd. No one knows what a phone book is anymore. But I'm going to attempt here is to put a hand on the right, hand on the left, and pull as hard as I can and see if I can't rip a thousand pages all at one time right down the middle. And uh, in the first service, uh, Pastor Clay just about had it, so we're going to give him one more shot, see if he can't rip it down the middle. Can't do it. Sorry. You did wrinkle the front page, though. That's good. All right, you got to encourage him on now, okay? Got to encourage him on. Make some noise. Make some noise. <laughs> That's not easy. <laughs> what else are you going to do? All right, I have a pan that I picked up at Walmart before the program, and what I'm gonna attempt to do with this is grab it between my hands, squeeze with all my might, and see if I can't roll this up till it looks like a big steel burrito when I'm through with it. I did notice on the back of the package, Pastor, that there was a 30-day return policy, so <laughs> if I'm able to do that, we'll take it back. All right, give me some encouragement. Look at that. You didn't let me try that one. <laughs> that looked easy. No. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that looked really difficult. Well, we got a little bit more of that to come. We're going to have fun today. Uh, Ron wrote a book called Tapped Out by Jesus from the Cage to the Cross, and it's available afterwards for 10 bucks. If you'd like to go pick one up on the plaza, he'll be out there signing autographs and taking pictures. And I uh, had a long line last service. I'm sure some of you will want to pick it up. It's a fun read. And uh, I enjoyed reading it and learned a lot about you. And so we was kind of I want to tell your story a little bit today. You uh, grew up in Greeley. And uh, you weren't always an athlete. And you, when you started off school, you got one chapter in here called Chubby. And they, the kids were kind of picking on you a little bit when you were, first got into grade school. Yeah, um, aside from being a little bit different physically than the rest of the kids in the class, I felt like I was one of those kids that uh, struggled learning. I just had a hard time picking things up as fast as the rest of my classmates did. So I was the kid that would have to read the first page and I'd have to read it five or six times before it would start to sink in and make sense to me. So that didn't just, uh, I mean, it started at an early age and went all the way up through all of my education. I just learned that I was going to have to to do a little bit more and study harder and and commit myself more if I wanted to be successful and succeed in life. So it was kind of a mentality that I started at an early age with with education and it carried right over onto uh, the athletic realm of that. And I had a, a teacher that I met in the fourth grade that got me turned on to wrestling. So I started wrestling at a, as a fourth grader and that was one thing that kind of gave me confidence and, and built me up a little bit. And then um, just strengthened me throughout my career. And I knew that, you know, when I get to high school, I was a football player, a wrestler, and that work ethic that I developed in the classroom carried right over onto the athletic field because, you know, I would stay after football practices Well, the rest of the kids would go inside and do sprints by myself. And after wrestling practices, I would head over to the staircase and, and run stairs for an extra 20 minutes after practice every night because I knew that if I was going to be successful or get ahead, I was going to have to work harder than everyone else did. So... It developed a good work ethic in me. One of the things I love about that story is that coach that encouraged you to try wrestling. I mean, your life might have been really different without that one person. 
You know, I think about people who are serving in children's ministries, serving in breakaway camp this week. And, and when you speak into young people and can see something in them, uh, everybody needs someone besides their parents that believe in them. That guy, that guy believed in you and got you on a, on a course that took you all the way through high school, you know, state champion wrestler, and then you got a scholarship to college. That's right. Um, it's amazing how much uh, teachers can influence. Is there any teachers in here today? Raise your hand if you're a teacher. Nice. We got quite a few teachers in here today. It's amazing how much uh, a teacher can influence a life, and half the time you don't even realize that you are being an influence to that person. But, you know, I remember my teachers, for, you know, for the rest of your life. I mean, I'm sure many of you do as well. Uh, and it actually impacted my life so much that uh, after I graduated from high school, I went on to college with, on a scholarship, but those teachers had such an impact in my life that that's exactly what I wanted to do. So four years later, when I graduated from um, college, I became a high school art teacher. Can you guys see me as a high school art teacher? <laughs> he looks like an artist, doesn't he? <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was great. I went back to school um, after I got that degree a year later and got a master's degree so I could be a, a little bit better teacher and coach um, and just loved what I did. So for 10 years, you were in Greeley and you were teaching, you were coaching. At this time, you weren't um, a decided follower of Jesus yet. No, I wasn't. And you talk in your book about the three G's, gold, glory, and girls. That kind of had your attention there for a while, huh? That's right. As a young adult, you know, I was one of those kids that was real ambitious. Uh, you know, I had all those, I was kind of a goal-driven guy. So, you know, I thought if I needed anything in life, I just needed to work a little bit harder and I need to, to go out and find my success and do it all by myself. And I didn't think I need anybody else's help. I was one of those kids that would compare themselves to their friends or the people that they spent time with. And I thought that if I lived a little bit cleaner life, a little bit better life than, than they did, certainly if that day came and I had to stand before the Lord, he'd let me into heaven. There wasn't any question in my mind because I was a pretty good person and I did a lot of good things. But um, I realized at an early age, actually I was 32, um, that it's impossible to say no to the things of this world until you first say yes to Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. So you, be, you became a Christian officially at age 32, and your dad's here. He was involved in that, wasn't he? He was very much. He had been on me for uh, at least a couple of years to attend a, a church service with him. We went to a, a church there in Grayley. My father had been going for quite a while and had great things to say about it, but I was at a time in my life where I was always way too busy on Sundays to attend a church service and take two hours out of my day. So I think I declined uh, many, many Sundays when he would ask me to attend with him. Um, until one point when I was at 32, I was, you know, at a low point in my life. I had been searching for all these materialistic things in my life, like thinking that that would find me happiness, um, you know, fame, glory, all these things that I'm chasing after. And, you know, none of them filled that void in your heart. Um, so I was at a point at 32, I had two young boys at the time that were at home that, that needed a godly father, and uh, I wasn't that for them. So I came to a point where I accepted my father's invitation on a Sunday and went to the service with him, and I was almost sure that my dad had picked, uh, talked to the pastor before I walked in that day because as he began to speak that day up on the stage, it just, it just felt like every word out of his mouth was directed right at me. And I felt something that day that I hadn't felt before. I felt like God was trying to get my attention. And I felt my heart just beating out of my chest. And I'm not a super emotional person, but it was all I could do to fight back the tears as I was just sitting there in the pews listening to the service that day. And at the end of uh, his invitation, or the end of his service, he offered an invitation to accept Jesus into your heart. And... That day I knew that, that I needed to quit running away from him and turning my back on him, and I needed to accept Christ into my life. So at the end of that service, I remember I was one of the first people that got up out of my seat and walked to the altar and asked Christ into my life. Wow, that's awesome. Most important decision. So it was not too much um, after that, if I understand correctly, that you had your first UFC fight. And most people don't start fighting the UFC when they're in their 30s. 
This is true, yeah. Most people are retiring at about 32, and I was just beginning my career. But like I told you earlier, I was a high school uh, wrestling coach, and my team had actually challenged me one night after a practice to enter a local mixed martial arts contest down in Denver called the Boss Root Invitational. And the UFC matchmaker was going to be the referee for all these fights. And the winner of those that competition was going to get invited right to the next UFC. So anyway, back in the early UFC, if any of you guys remember those, um, the wrestlers were pretty dominant, and I figured I was a pretty good wrestler, so I'd give it a shot. So I took my team up on the challenge, drove down to Denver, and had three fights in one night, uh, finished all three of them in under about 30 seconds, and sure enough, got invited right to the next Ultimate Fighting Championship. And my, uh, my mixed martial arts career just kind of exploded after that. So you were on a roll. Uh, you get into the cage, and is there any rules? There wasn't a lot back, back when it started. <laughs> it's changed a little bit today. But. So you could be a boxer, you could be a wrestler, you could be a you want to be all of guy. Them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, let's just let's give an example from one of these. We got a video here. Ron Waterman is a destructive fighter. Ron. Ready, go! Okay, Waterman has said that he knows that Valentine's going to want to keep this standing up, but Waterman. A former All-American Division II from University of Northern Colorado is probably going to take it to the mat at will. He's, yes, he's very strong, man. I, I, he took me down like, oh, hey, up my, up my back again. Nice. <laughs> he's got a very good base. From my dad is good. He felt I should get out, out of the corner. And it's a high shot by, and there he goes. Waterman gets the takedown. Valentine no, should go close the guard. That's one thing for sure, especially with the rules that these are allowed. Cross face here already. Which is a very good thing to do. Ron Waterman recently became a minister with Team Impact, and they tour to preach the Bible. And I asked him if there was any uh, of a contradiction between what he does for a living and uh, what he, well, how he preaches. And he said that God needs people from all walks of life. That's well said. Amen. Man, the commentators are <laughs> preaching too. That's right. <laughs> so we didn't show the whole thing there, but it only went two minutes and 18 seconds. And that guy ended up with a hurting shoulder. <laughs> yeah, I, I give him a chance to tap out, but if they don't, then it goes a little bit further and dislocated didn't it that one did yeah show me show me again what you were trying to do there what do you call that move it's called a key lock okay and you take so you're gonna be on the ground during this but i won't make you get on the ground here okay <laughs> all right so you do that and then you do that and then you just keep going until i tap out right <laughs> hey i didn't tap out <laughs> <laughs> yeah i could see how that could be a little uncomfortable so at the end uh you won in two Go ahead and show that next video in two minutes and 18 seconds uh, on that I one. Guess it's two minutes and 18 seconds of round number one. Uh, it was a tap out by Valentine uh, Overeem. And Ron Waterman is here in Pride. What a personality, what an interesting individual. I look forward to Ron Waterman coming back. Yep. So let this be a lesson for all the wrestlers at home. If somebody ever catch you like that, never let it pass your hand. Man, you're such a nice guy and with a sweet spirit, but you can get... I get competitive sometimes. You get sometimes. riled up. <laughs> you got to be competitive to get in there. That's got to be one of the hardest sports there are. There are. I mean, it doesn't get much harder than that. So what do you say when people say, how can you be a Christian and a fighter? How does that, how can that both be happening? You know, I'd say over the years, that's probably the most common question I get from, from other people and especially from other Christians is they ask, you know, how can I go into a ring and a cage and, and do what I do? And, you know, it's, it's pretty simple to me. It's, to me, it's, it's another sport. It's just like anything else to me. I don't have hateful intentions when I walk into the cage, but it's like you heard in the video, um, God needs people in all walks of life, and it doesn't matter what profession you're in. He needs witnesses, and he needs people that can share the gospel. And it was so neat in a lot of these fights that, 
you know, I'd be on national television after a fight and I could quote a scripture and, and give praise to the Lord instead of pointing my finger at myself, which we see so many professional athletes do today when they score a touchdown. It just, it doesn't make sense to me, you know, to, to not, to give that credit to yourself because I knew, I mean, the only reason I was there is because God allowed me and gave me those, those tools to do that. Amen. I'm pretty sure the Apostle Paul was a boxing fan. I'll prove it to you. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who keep, competes in the games, he's talking about the Olympic games, they were going back in those days, goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So Paul's using two examples there, running like a marathon, and you have to run with a goal, not aimlessly, and boxing. You don't just hit the air. You I mean, go in for, hit them in the head. And uh, he, says, he says, I'm going to apply that to my spiritual life, and I'm going to discipline myself and just like they have strict training, I'm going to have strict training as well. And so what is training like for competition? Well, uh, you know, you put together a camp usually before a big fight like that, and you spend three or four months training pretty seriously for it. But um, when you get to that level, it's, it's more than just the three months that you've put in. It's basically your whole lifetime. And I was a, a wrestler for, you know, 16 years of my life. So I all those years building up to that actually helped prepare me for that actual event, you know, and it, it was, it's the confidence you get knowing when you step into the ring that no one can defeat you and that uh, you've got so much confidence, you can't let nerves, especially in a sport like this, you can't let your nerves start to take play, take play in it because your adrenaline will shoot all your energy out. So you've got to be able to channel that and be confident. And, you know, obviously there was times where you get nervous before fights, especially the day before. Um, but there's a, a scripture I always like to share, uh, Joshua 1.9, and I would repeatedly, the day before, and I would just repeat that and repeat that and repeat that when I would get into the ring, I would even, I would even be praying that to myself. And you, got it it, you got it memorized? Yeah, it oh. says, be strong, be courageous, do not be dismayed, for I am the Lord your God, and I will be with you wherever you go. That's a good promise. Yeah, and uh, that just gave me so much comfort, and I could just feel my anxiety inside just starting to drop, and by the time that fight started, I was just dialed in and no more, no more anxiety. I knew that I had somebody in my corner that was going to be with me regardless. You work out every day? Pretty close, about five, five days a week. Cardio and weights? More cardio now than it, than it used to be, but more cardio than weights, but yeah. Okay. Um, the, the thing about tr physical fitness I've noticed when I let myself get out of shape or get back into better shape, it has an impact when I'm more disciplined on other areas of my life positively. Have you noticed that too? Absolutely. You know, one of the biggest questions I've got when I travel around and, and to get to talk is, you know, I see these kids will come up to me and say, man, how do you get these great big muscles? And I tell these guys that, you know, your, your spiritual growth is no different than your growth in the gym. Uh, you've got to be committed. You've got to have dedication. You've got to commit yourself every single day. Um, and my spiritual growth is no different. I've got to commit myself when I wake up to, to get into God's word. And if I want to be a, a good father, a good husband, a good spiritual leader in my home, I've got to devote the time that's necessary to God's word and, and prayer and and staying close to him. And that's something that develops over time. It doesn't just happen overnight. Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 4, 8 writes, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise both for both the present life and the life to come. And that's what I hear him saying there is that, of course, spiritual training is the most important, but physical training is also important. It says it's of some value. And they can really uh, have a, a dovetail effect in terms of helping us become more di disciplined in every area of our life. That's inspiring. So it sounds like from what you're saying that getting in there and winning a fight is more mental than physical, even though you've got to be in shape. 
a lot of it's right here. Absolutely. I think at any professional level, I mean, the, the mental aspect of it at that point, I mean, obviously to get to that level, you had to prepare yourself and you've got to be a pretty good athlete to get there. But uh, the mental preparation is probably 90% of the battle. You've got to have that much confidence in yourself and your abilities and, um, and just knowing that, I mean, when I would step in there, I mean, I would be super confident. There was no way I had even a doubt in my mind that my opponent could could defeat me in that ring or that cage. That made you deadly. So uh, you you fought at all, all different elevations. You know, we're at 5,000 feet here. It probably makes a difference, huh? Yeah, lots of people actually wanted to come to Colorado to train with me out here because it was because of our elevation. It helps a lot. You mentioned uh, how you have to really, you've got to pace yourself because if you're going to go the whole distance, you got to be able to breathe. Yeah, especially in my sport when you're fighting for 15 or 20 minutes, if you let your adrenaline take over, I mean, you're done in, in five minutes, that's all you get. Really? So you've got to be able to, to channel that energy and know when to relax and know when to exert yourself. And it's a, that's a, a, another part of the mental aspect of the yeah. game. It's like chess. How many fights in the UFC? 26 professional fights. Wow. Yeah. You ever get knocked out? I did. <laughs> Just once, but. Just once? Yeah. So what I love about what you do did through this is you use this as a platform. We all have a platform. Maybe it's your social media platform. Maybe it's your, your job. Maybe it's your, some hobby you're good at. Being a father, by the way, is a platform that we can use positively or negatively. And you use this platform to give the glory to God. You mentioned that before. I got just a little clip from an interview here that illustrates. I'd like to take all the credit for this win, but I have to credit it all to the Lord because He's blessed me with some tools and some abilities to compete like I have, and I owe it all to him. Amen. Way to go. Way to give him the glory. So there came a day where, right in the beginning of that clip, there was just a little bit of it, where you were actually in a video game. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, early on in, uh, in my UFC career, they were making the very first UFC video game for PlayStation and uh, uh, a, another game called Dreamcast. But anyway, they asked me if I would be interested in being in that first video game. So they flew me out to California and put these electrodes all over my body. And I spent a couple days out there being put into the first video game. So it was kind of neat to come home and my boys were playing my character on the, on the video game. And, and what's cool about that too is they had done their homework on you enough to actually have the video game got dude praying and giving glory to God, right? Yeah, that's what was, was so cool about it because they actually did do their homework. They actually watched my fights and they saw as I walked into the octagon that I always took a knee and, and said a prayer before my fight and they actually put that into the video game. So I thought that was a pretty cool addition. Yeah, just another way to give glory to God. So it's amazing how God directs our paths, and we don't always know what's coming next. We have to keep an open hand. I was preaching about that a few weeks ago because sometimes closed doors and open doors are the way he directs us. And uh, you, on the airplane to go out there to start the video game process, had an encounter with a person that ended up redirecting your life. Yeah, I ended up sitting next to this guy that just started up a conversation and... Um Ended up talking to me for quite a while and went on and on about how thought, neat he thought it was that I was a UFC fighter and being put in this video game. And he goes, well, I've got a good friend of mine that's named Shane McMahon, and I can set you up with an interview with him if you'd be interested in professional wrestling. And as most of you know, Vince McMahon is his father. Um, so he set it up, and a week later, I was on another airplane to fly to Stamford, Connecticut, where I sat in this big boardroom with Stane, Shane and Stephanie, uh, McMahon and Jim Ross and all these executives and they offered me a four-year contract right there on the spot to compete in the WWF at the time. It was before it transferred over to WWE. I was there through that transition. Um, and I got offered... Had that, that been a dream of yours when you were a kid? Yeah, it really had. As a, as a small kid, I think everybody wants to be a, a big professional wrestler. So that was really a dream come true for me and I thought it would be a, a great opportunity. Um, so I... I took them up on that, and they actually flew me down to, the, to uh, the, it's like their little training camp. It was in Louisville, Kentucky at the time, called Ohio Valley Wrestling. So I, I walk into this, this big sports room, and I've got guys like uh, The Big Show, and John Cena, and Brock Lesnar, and Batista, and Mark Henry, and all of these great big 
professional wrestlers are in there, and we all started at the same time, so it was kind of neat to, uh, we had our own little mini league that we started in down there, and then you wait, hopefully in the next year, you get called up to the main traveling roster, so after about six or seven months, I got called up and started to get to travel around the world with The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, and uh, The Undertaker, and Stone Cold Steve Austin, and all the, the big guys that you see on television today, so it was pretty surreal at first. No kidding. You ended up wrestling in front of 25,000 fans in Madison Square Garden. We got a clip of you coming in here it for that one. To kick it all off with our opening contest. The following tag team match is scheduled for one fall. Come on to the arena and come down the aisle at a combined weight of 551 pounds. Ron H2O Waterman and Brock Lister. <laughs> that looks fun. I can't imagine the energy of 25,000 fans because I wasn't down there last night in the ball arena. Anybody watch that last night? <laughs> Avalanche are only two wins away from the Stanley Cup. Seven to zero, man. That's a football score. That was awesome. So you had the same thing going on there. And let's, uh, before we look at this other clip of you guys actually doing the stuff, um, wrestling, this, this kind of wrestling is, is, it's like you've got to go to kind of go to an acting school a little bit too, don't you? I actually did for a while, yeah. You did? <laughs> and so it's, it's a little bit scripted from what I understand. Predetermined is the correct. Predetermined? Is the, is the correct word, yeah. <laughs> So I came, uh, you know, I'm not, a, I don't know a lot about this. So reading your book, I, I learned about the face and the heel guy. I'd, I'd never heard about that. Explain that. So in wrestling, you've got a good guy and you've got a bad guy. So the, the crowd's usually going to cheer for the, the good guy, which is the face in this case. The heel is a bad guy. So if he's going to win the match, he's going to probably end up cheating. He's going to distract the referee or he's going to uh, cheat somehow to get the victory and still make the face look good. So there's a lot more that goes into this behind the scenes than people really realize. And you just get assigned. You don't get a pick, huh? Because you'd rather be the face guy, right? The nice guy? I would, guy? yeah. I usually was the face because that's kind of... Because you're a nice guy. It's more who I am. But sometimes you had to be a heel, right? There, occasionally, yep. When uh, Vince McMahon said that you need, you're going to be a heel tonight, so you need to go out and, and play the part. And and people take it seriously, man. They, like, they get mad at the bad guy, don't they? There was often times when we were out on the East Coast and... It's like NASCAR and professional wrestling, and I, they take it seriously, and they think that it's real. So, I mean, we'd have to get bodyguards to get taken out of the auditorium sometimes because fans just wanted to tear you apart. Oh, man. <laughs> Serious business. All right, let's watch a, a clip of there in Madison Garden of you guys going after it. That's Ron, the b blonde guy. <laughs> were you sore after one of those? <laughs> Very. <laughs> it looked like you were hitting the ground pretty hard there. Um, you know, along with making it to that level and becoming a celebrity brings a lot with it. A lot of opportunities, temptations, bad influence. You got fans all that want your attention and autographs and all that. And, and uh, that's not always easy for guys to navigate that. No, it was actually really difficult because I was a brand new Christian at the time. And, you know, I went into the profession with great intentions, thinking that, you know, I'm going to change all these guys up here at this level and I'm going to be preaching to them. I was talk, thinking about, right, I could hold Bible studies before the, the matches and all this stuff. But I tell you, I was just so overwhelmed by, uh, by the negative influences in that environment that as a new Christian and not having, you know, a lot of accountability partners right there beside me that I could lean on for help. Um, I was just overwhelmed by the whole thing. And, um, 
you kind of get caught up in those in those three G's. Like I say in my book there, you know, the gold, glory, and girls. You can get caught up in that so easy today and so fast. And before long, you end up, you know, you're you're adapting more to their lifestyle than they're adapting to yours. And so after a couple of years, I knew that it was it was time to get out of that. You know, I was I had two young boys at home that that needed the, a godly father at home, and um, and I wasn't that at the time. So it was it was hard. It was a hard environment to be in. I was thinking about that uh, when we talked about Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. It says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast in their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. You had a chance to do all that, but you chose to to do the last part of this where it says, but to let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. So that's, that's our goal. We're going to boast in the right thing, in the Lord, not in our wisdom, our strength, our money, or whatever. And you talked about how you found another Christian brother for a while while you were wrestling. And um, peer pressure is something we all face. Some people think it's just students. But no, we, we all are uh, influenced by our peers negatively or positively. And you talk about that to high school kids when you talk. But uh, Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And so you found that helpful to, to get that kind of a relationship as well as you were trying to stay the course. Yeah, very much so. It helped me a lot to have someone that I could lean on. But I think so many times, especially when I go into schools and talk to, to kids today, that it's so easy to want to just fit into the crowd and, and be part. And we end up jeopardizing our morals, our standards, our beliefs, uh, just so we can be liked and accepted and fit in. And, you know, I let those kids know that if those people are expecting you to do those things, you don't need them to like you or accept you. And sometimes you need to, you know, just stand up for what you know is right, even if it means you have to stand alone and, and find new friends. And, it's difficult even for, for adults to do sometimes. I mean, I talk to the kids, but I tell them right there in front of them that, you know what, I have to do the same thing. Your parents have to do the same thing. We have to look at the people that we spend time with, that we invest our, our energy in. Are, are, they, are we jeopardizing our morals and standards and beliefs just so we can be part of that, you know, or is, or is that honoring God? It's good for all of us. Uh, you told me one of your key life verses is what Jesus said in Mark 8, 36. He said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Talk about that. You know, that's a, a life verse that I sign whenever I sign a signature for anyone. I always put Mark 8, 36 on that. Um, I just felt like so many years of my life I spent chasing after all those materialistic things in life, thinking that it was going to make me happy and bring me happiness. You know, living in that million dollar house and driving around in that hundred thousand dollar car and having all the toys and keeping up with everyone else and, uh, you know, it bring you happiness, but for a real short time. And then you'd always feel that empty spot in your heart, you know, that you were searching and the one that only the Lord can fill. Um, so I, I, I chased after all those dreams and it just, that verse hits home so well for me. What, what good is it? Uh, to gain the whole world, but they lose your own soul and jeopardize those things. Amen. So as the door closes for the uh, worldwide wrestling um, entertainment, another door opens for ministry. Tell us about that. You know, sometimes we don't understand what God's doing in our life, and we've got this plan all perfectly set out, and this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, and oftentimes that door closes and out of nowhere, and, and you don't understand why, and you just can't figure out why God would shut a door on you. And in my life, I mean, I had this aspiring professional wrestling career that was building up, and all of a sudden that door was shut on me. Um, but it wasn't, but a couple weeks later, after that door was shut, that another door was open with Team Impact Ministries, and it's a, a strength team that's combined of NFL football players and bodybuilders and power lifters and world strongman competitors. Um, but more than being just those big athletes, they were sold out to Jesus. 
And all of a sudden I got to travel with this strength team where we'd go into schools and churches. A church would bring us in for the week and we would do these huge programs at night uh, where we're breaking bricks on stage and breaking out of handcuffs and lifting telephone poles over our heads. And, but the kids would love this stuff because uh, we'd go to the schools during the day where we had to share a secular message. Um, it's kind of sad in America that we can't go into schools today and, and share our faith and talk about God. I, I really don't understand it. Because when we fly over to Africa or Japan or India, the first thing they do when we walk into those schools is they tell us to share our faith. And then we come back home and, you know, sometimes we've had to turn our shirts inside out because there's scripture on it. It just doesn't make sense to us. But uh, so we share a, a secular message in the school, but we invite those kids in those to come out and watch us at the nighttime program. So the kids are all fired up, want to come out and see these big, strong guys do these feats of strength, but they bring their fair pair of parents with them and their friends with them. So we have a big audience at night where we do get to stand up and share a testimony. And then we'll do a few more big feats of strength, and then one of the other members of the team will stand up and, and do a salvation message asking those people to, to come to the Lord. So over the years, it's been 20 years now, I've seen hundreds of thousands of people walk forward at the end of the night and give their lives to Jesus. It's awesome. I think you said one time 10,000 made a decision in India. In India, That's yeah. incredible. And most of them walked to the incredible. event. <laughs> and so you're still using, I mean, you're a realtor, you're a, you're a forest fighter, and, but it, like once a month on an average, we don't see you here because you're doing evangelism somewhere. Yeah. Using these gifts God's given you to attract a crowd and then talk about what's most important. Amen. That's how we're going to wrap up today. Let's do a couple more feats and then let's, let's talk about what's most important as we wrap up. Perfect. What are you going to do? What do you got left? Well, I have a metal baseball bat down here. And what we usually do in school assemblies is we bring a wooden baseball bat, a Louisville slugger, and we bring it out there. It takes about 400 pounds of pressure to, to snap one of those Louisville sluggers over our leg. And, but we'd been doing this for several years, and it never failed that after a program, we'd have some kid walk up to us and say, you know what, you guys do those metal bats, or those wooden bats. Why don't you ever do metal bats? So I would tell him to shut up and go sit back down. <laughs> I'm kidding. I wouldn't tell him to sit back down. So anyway, we've been attempting the last few years trying to break these uh, bend or sometimes even break these metal bats and uh, there was a couple times on national television where I failed it was quite embarrassing but sometimes uh, they just they just don't go so we'll see what we have this morning and we'll give this a shot you guys are gonna have to cheer me on don't give up Al come on come on come on Look at that. <laughs> Good job. Now what we got? Now I have a Diet 7-Up can. And uh, I have kind of an unusual way of opening these cans. I don't just click the tab and take a drink like normal people. I'm going to place it in my hand, squeeze with all my might, and see if I can get this can to explode. But I was telling everybody that the cans really don't have that much pressure on them if you don't shake them up. And Pastor was super careful with the can, the people backstage. So you guys don't have anything to worry about because we didn't really shake this can up. So it should just kind of dribble out. Sometimes I get more on me than anybody else does. So you guys in the front row thought you had the best seats, didn't you? All right. One more time. Give me some, give me some noise. All right. Oh, that's 
That's awesome. I think some of it went about halfway back. Did you get it? There, you got it right there. In the last service, in the last service, that piece went all the way to the second to the back row, and the guy was the first one in line out there because he wanted him to sign it. That's pretty good. Can I keep the God uses these feats of strength to gather people to hear the gospel. And as we wrap up here, that's what we want to do, is we just want to make an appeal and talk about what's most important and pray together. And I want to just turn that over to you, Brother Ron. Awesome. Well, you know, maybe somebody out there today in the, in the audience was kind of like me when I went to the service that time with my father and sat there and felt something I hadn't felt before. And I felt like God was tugging at my heart and I needed to make a decision. And I never liked to end one of my programs where I get to speak without offering that same invitation to everyone here today. Um, you know, I spent 32 years of my life running from God, and it took me 32 years to figure out that He was the only thing that was going to fill that void in my heart. And I just want to ask you guys today, when was that time and where was that place for you? When you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart to be your Lord, to be your Savior, you know, I talk to so many people and I ask them, you know, if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? Where would you spend, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And almost all of them say the same thing. Of course I would go to heaven. They did what I did for 32 years. They would compare themselves usually to other people. They'd say, you know what, I'm a pretty good person. So of course when that day comes and I was to stand in front of the Father, I'd be, I'd be led into heaven. Or they say, you know what, I go to church a lot of times on Sundays or they say you know what I know who God is and all three of those are great answers but none of those are going to get you to heaven John 3 3 says unless a man is born again he's not fit for the kingdom of heaven when was that time and where was that place that you said that prayer that you asked Jesus into your life I know the day I can just feel exactly where I was that moment in my life when I said that prayer myself. You may not know the exact time and date, but you should have a pretty good idea in your life when that was. I'm going to ask all of you right now just to bow your heads with me and close your eyes and ask yourself that same question, where was I when I said that prayer and asked Jesus to come into my heart? If you can't remember that, I'm going to give you that opportunity today. I'm going to count to three in just a minute. And I'm just going to have you slip your hand into the air and you say, you know what, Ron, I want you to include me in that prayer. But more importantly, I want you to say, Jesus, hear my prayer this morning. And he will. And he'll answer that prayer. But if you can't recall a time, you can't recall a place, let me include you in that prayer today. I'm just going to have you slip your hand into the air. This isn't between you and who you came with today. This is between you and God. I'm going to count. One, today is the day of salvation. Two, and three. Slip your hands up. Say yes to Jesus. Don't run. Don't be ashamed of God. He won't be ashamed of you. Keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. You can put your hands down. And I'm going to have everyone repeat this after me. Say, Dear Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, offering me salvation. Then rising on the third day, proving that you are God. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I repent of my sins I turn my back on my past. And from this day forward, I will live for you and serve you every day of my life. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap today. Let's stand together. We're going to close our service with a song about running to the Father. 
He always wants you to run to him, not to run away from him. Congratulations to those of you making decisions today. Love to see you get baptized next week. If you haven't been baptized yet, we're having a baptism next week. It's going to be a big celebration party at the end of Breakaway. And uh, let's just say thanks again one more time to Mr. Ron Waterman. Thank you, Ron. (laughs) 